Members of the company, this is your places call. Places, please. Places for the top of the podcast. Places, please. Get ready for a behind-the-scenes look at the glitz and not-so-glam of Broadway, education, and everyday life with Uncommon Sense. Join hosts Christopher Smith and Sharna Lopez as they bring you the best stories and shenanigans that seemingly prove how elusive common sense can really be. So take a little time for yourself to hang out with the dynamic duo Sharnifer. And no leaving early, because you might just miss that 11 o'clock number. Stand by music. Music. Go. Uncommon sense The eleven o'clock And we are I have to be ready. I was totally having a side conversation with myself. I I love that. And I'm like, are you ready? Yes. And then, oh, wait, I'm not, but I am. Okay. I mean, I'm ready. I just was (laughs) reading. Hello, everyone. Hi. How are we? Uh, I think we are good. Sharna fans. We are? are... I mean, Sharna fur is staying alive. This time of year staying is, alive, is a lot. Staying alive. Oh, 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 uh, uh, oh. Uh, uh. Yeah. Name, name the show. Name the show. Wait, this is not the this right not episode. The right episode. Save that for the other yeah. episode. <laughs> All right. But, oh, but Christopher, seriously, this time of year is a lot. It's for bonkers. For teachers, for bonkers. parents, for people. Bonkers. I like that. Bonkers. You know what we should do an episode on? Like what? our top 10 fun words we like to use. Oh. Each. I'll have to think about that. Like hooligan would definitely be a <laughs> hooligan. Mind. Yeah, hooligan. Oh, yes. That's a Yahoo and a hooligan put together. Ooh, shenanigans. I just wore our Sharnifer shirt. Did you? The other day. Oh, yeah. Fine. And I was looking at our hashtags and I was like, oh, shenanigans should be on there. Yeah. I like it. We have so many things that should be on all of our things. <laughs> So many things on all of the things. Yes. For the things that people need when they need things. That's right. Exactly. All the things. <laughs> uh, oh, gosh. So, Sharna. Wait. I what? think one of our hashtags is all the things. I think it is. I'm going to go back and look at my shirt. <laughs> okay, good. Great. Oh, gosh. Okay, crazy. so. All right, what are we talking about today, Christopher? I think we should talk about theater terms. We've never really talked about, like, theater um, vocabulary. And I, I think it could be fun. So, okay. um, I sound, I found Count this. me in. Oh, all right. All right. A five, six, seven. Eight. Ooh. Yes. <laughs> or you could do Chicago. Oh, that's true. Five, six, seven, eight. Da, 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 da. Yeah. That's the new question. How many shows start with a five, six, seven, eight? Oh, dang. I only know two. Me too. Just I think that might be the only two. Okay, so <laughs> the first theater term is break a leg. Do you know about this, Sharna? Break a leg? Have you ever heard I mean, that term? I know the term break a leg. Uh, yes, I have. <laughs> break legs, break leg. I remember when I was younger, kind of being like, ooh, I like something fun and not really like understanding it. And you just like say it. Yeah. It's just like a saying. Um, I actually do not know the meaning behind it. Yeah, so I- Do you? Didn't I didn't until I looked this up, and we know it means but good luck, obviously. Um, and there's no, I think there's no like hard and fast. This is what it means and why it happened. But one theory is that in ancient Greece they didn't clap for performances and they stopped. And the more they stopped, the more chance there was of breaking a leg, which is kind of interesting to think about. And this tradition reappeared in Elizabethan England when audiences would stomp their chairs. This one makes more sense to me, I feel mm. like. And then the more they stomp the chair, the more likely they are to break a chair leg. To break the leg of the chair. Yeah. So wishing someone break a leg is like, get a huge round of applause. Yeah, basically. Like, good luck for all. Like get that. all the uh, thunderous applause. Yeah. 
Now, are you superstitious in the way, like, if you say good luck, it's bad luck? Uh, no, I know but I know that people, that's a thing. Oh, don't say good luck. You should say break a leg. Yeah. yeah. I, I I'm just not, not really that superstitious in general. <laughs> so, like, yeah, even... Not me either. Even I'm the, like, like the, um, the Macbeth thing in the theater, you know? Yeah. I'm like, what? Dude, okay. some of those students get crazy about that, though. And even the ghost Very light... Silly. Some people get real serious about that. Like they get real mad if you don't turn on the ghost light. Yeah, it's a thing for sure. Um, You want me to read the next one? Yeah, you do the next one. All right. So the next one is Merd, which for a long time I didn't know. Yeah. Um, And it says theater performers opt for break a leg, but dancers commonly wish each other Merd, which directly, directly translates to... Beep in French. I'll say it now in case you have little ears in the car. You can do earmuffs, Earmuffs. as we say. Uh, It literally transfers to shit in French, which is so funny. I did find that out, I remember, like, in high school. It says, the origin of this tradition traces back to 19th century Paris when attendees of the Paris Opera Ballet would pull up to the famed, I'm going to say it wrong, Palace Garnier in horse-drawn carriages. The more audience members, the more carriages, the more horses, the more Mm. mare. Got it. Very interesting. Yeah. That is really funny. But I guess, if you think about it, phrases that we coin now, yeah. they had to find ways to phrase them way back then in the 19th century. That's right. That makes sense. Well, there you go. There you go. And also probably kind of funny back then, too. Mad. Oh, I've never said married, though, to anybody. Me. Uh, have I? I don't know. I think I might have. Not, it's not my common, not my common phrase that I that I use. Okay, the next one though, I do not know and it's making me chuckle. Uh I cannot say either of the other ones. I can say the first one. So it's toy toy toy. And but I don't know the other ones. I don't I'm not even going to attempt. So I'll just talk In about Boca al Lupo. There you go. You're going to attempt. In Boca al Lupo and Chupas. So around the world, there are yet more phrases to substitute for well wishes and toy toy toy. That one I have definitely seen in opera um, and heard like from my opera friends. Uh, but it means in German, it's the it's spitting to ward off evil spirits and bad luck. So I like that. Yeah, I like that. It's like be gone with you. Toy, toy, toy. <laughs> <laughs> so like getting all the, the, the bad juju yeah. out and having a good show. Be gone. OK, I, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So that's basically it's just um, another. So, but the next part in Boca, in Boca Alupo means in the wolf's mouth, and the correct response is Crepe Alupo, which means may the wolf die. Ooh. Wow, to ward off bad omens. So it's more like getting the bad things out. Yeah, like you're saging the theater before. Yes. Interesting. Oh, I love and this And then one. Australians say chukas, <laughs> which is believed to be a permutation. Of chook or chicken. That is funny because I call my dog Chooky. Chookers. You do? I call How did it. that I happen? And now I know. I don't know. I give my animals the strangest names. Like his name is Winston. Yeah. And we call him Chook. Like what? Yeah. I had a cat growing up. Her name was Persnickety Snickers. And I called her Chabibs. Like, I don't know what. I don't what? know. What? Don't you do that with your animals? Like we call, sure we call Winston. I never did that with my animals. Things. I named them, and then I that was their name. Like, <laughs> you don't call them, like, pet names. Like, Winston, it translates, like, Winston. And right. then my sister-in-law started calling him Weenstone. And then we started calling him Beanstone. And now we call him Bean, Beanie. Like, well, see, that's how it happens. At it least, just evolves. Well, at least that, like, has a, a direct evolution from Winston. Yeah. Some of that, like... Chooky. I don't know. It's just because when I want to squish him, it's like a little chook. And then you got to squish him up. I might, if he was extra furry, I would say maybe like Chewbacca. But like, I don't know. (laughs) Chewy. (laughs) Chew. I don't know how I know that means chicken. Chook. There you go. Australian. And then it says, in the old days, chicken was considered a delicacy by saying, chukas, you're hoping the performers will go well and make money. So that the performer can afford a gourmet meal. Ooh. I love the old ties to all of this. Yeah. I'm going to start implementing chukas. Yeah, I like chukas. it. Chukas. I <laughs> like it. Can you imagine? Students would be like, what are you saying? Like, well, let me inform you. I could, I could teach them up. Yeah. Or you just up. say, please refer to my podcast episode 
number 64, 5. I don't remember. Oh my gosh. Is that what we're on? Yeah. Yes. Okay. The next right, you one. Want to the next one? Yes. In the limelight. So, oh. the limelight. You've heard of this, yes or no? I've heard of the phrase, yeah. but not for theater. Oh, okay. What do, What have you like, used it as or heard it as? Like in the limelight? Like, I don't know. Like in the spotlight? Yeah, kind of. I, know, I like, think. Is that similar? I guess I would say that I haven't heard of it in only reference to theater. I think it's so, any sort of yeah, like performance space in the inter- right. entertainment industry. So. Okay. So this is how it came about. The limelight was the first gas lamp alternative for lighting theaters. And invented in the early 1800s, the limelight was generated by heating calcium oxide. Get ready, everybody. We're doing a science lesson with a blend of (laughs) oxygen and hydrogen. So that's how it was created. And then theaters first began using limelight in the 1830s as the first spotlight. So, yes, being in the spotlight. I think you're. Yeah, in the spotlight. Yeah. In the limelight. Yeah. And so now we continue to say that for people that are like the center of attention. That I really like that yeah. one. I had no idea that that's where that came from. Yeah. That's cool. In the limelight. Oh Lord. Yeah. This next one that you're gonna talk about. I love it. Is kind of our life. <laughs> I'm excited. So the next I we, I we use this a lot yeah. outside of theater, just yeah. in our daily lives. Um, is wing it. Yep. Just wing it. Um it's interesting because I have used that phrase my whole life, yeah. like not even related to theater. Yeah. I think a lot of people understand what that phrase means outside of theater, but it says uh, this theater phrase has now been incorporated into the greater colloquial. Yeah. But so obviously everyone's using yeah. it, but it says when actors would wing it, they were going on unprepared. It mm-hmm. comes from the practice of playing a part without memorizing the lines, relying on the prompter in the wings oh. Or pages of text affixed to set pieces like the wing flats. That makes sense. Yeah. So, so winging it, obviously the wings of the stage are, if, if you're not a theater person, are the side of the stage where you yeah. would exit to the left or the right in the wings. And a prompter um, sits in the wings often, uh, not now so much, but I remember um, being younger and doing some shows where there was a prompter side stage. Oh. Um, that makes sense. So then if somebody's going on unrehearsed or there was understudy or whatnot and they're winging it, you know, the prompters in the wings, or I love how it says that uh, pieces of the text yeah. and of the script are affixed to set pieces. Yeah. That's awesome. I've totally had people in shows do that specific thing, even to this day. Like people will put pieces of text on the set piece or yeah. in their binder, like during Spelling Bee, for yep. example, you can have... All yep. kinds of stuff if you're Rona or Panch up on that desk and ain't nobody going to know. Yeah, there was one. Oh, it's How to Succeed. Mm. So for all of How to Succeed, he's around that little book. Yeah. Because he's reading the book, How to Succeed in Business. And right. I remember telling both of my Finches, like, you can put stuff in there if you need, yeah. if you need help. Yeah. yeah. I'm actually surprised we don't do that anymore. I wonder how that yeah. became a thing and then didn't become a thing. And especially in our world of technology. Yeah, I don't... I'm surprised we don't have like teleprompters too, up by like the conductor's screen, you know, with like right. script well, up there. If you think about like church, like when we sing, yeah. If, if we ever, if I ever sing yeah. in the worship band, they have prompters, yeah. always with all the lyrics and everything. Yeah. That's so interesting. But I guess now, like you rehearse enough that you shouldn't need it. I guess there would be somebody. I don't know all the amplification. I think. Back in old days when they were doing Shakespearean plays with no amplification and someone was like, to be or not to be in the middle of the stage and they couldn't remember. And someone was on the side stage like, that is the question, right? right. Like, I think it's different when there's like a microphone and there's all this, like, maybe yeah, that's maybe. when it sort of started to phase out. Maybe. But I remember having somebody side stage with a script in a couple shows, more so to probably be following the show. But I, yeah, I can recall yeah. helping out. Times. My gosh, that takes me back to a story. I don't know if I've told the story on here, but when I was, oh gosh, I literally have no idea how old I was, probably 11 or 12. And I had sort of written this version of the Chris- A Christmas Carol and I was playing Christopher Scrooge. And that was literally <laughs> my character name. Oh no. 
Christopher Scrooge. And I was doing this monologue and the director sitting in the front row. This was a church thing. We did it at my church. And she was sitting in the front pew and I completely blanked halfway through the monologue. And she was not getting the clue. I'm like, hello, right here. So I finally (laughs) stopped, interrupted myself. And I'm like, help me here, people. Help me. (laughs) Literally in the middle of it? Yep, broke character, 100%. And... But I'm like, girl, you are sitting well, right I, there. Just tell me the next line. What's wrong with you? I think it's funny because when we do like church shows or younger shows or yeah. camps at uh, my studio, there's always a director right in the front yeah. when five-year-old yeah. Joey's like, ah, and exactly. like, I'm ready or whatever and you whisper right. it. Right. Um, I think something that is tricky at sort of the level we teach at OSHA, especially right now I'm doing a show with seventh, eighth, ninth graders. I tell kids, do not whisper the line to your neighbor because you, that's that's super unprofessional. If someone's forgotten their line, you cannot lean over as like character number three and be like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, right. I'm sorry. like just fix the scene. Right. Like if you want to say the line or if you want to get out of the scene right. and you want to improv, you know, your way around it, do not lean over and be like, it's your line. Right. <laughs> Cause some kids will, like I some know. kids will, they don't, they're learning, yeah, you know, they're learning. And I'm like, no, don't, don't do that. Also, like I've had to teach a few kids during this production, like you can't laugh like as yourself at what's going on on stage. Like you, ha- would your character laugh at that? Like you can't be laughing at Christopher right. because he's funny. I mean, like they, they sort of get hard, out of though, character. If people are funny. I mean, but yes, true. you have to. That's true. You do need to stay in character. Oh gosh. Okay. Right, you want to do the next one? Yeah. The next one, dark theater or dark day. I have never said it either way. I just say they're dark or the show is dark yeah. or whatever. But in case you don't know what that means, the majority of professional productions play eight shows over six days of the week. And the day off where there is no show is the theater's quote dark day for the simple fact that all the lights are off as there is no performance. Yeah. Sense. yeah. And I've always so known just like, that. Oh, that, that, that shows dark Monday, Tuesday, yeah. that shows dark Monday, that shows dark Friday, whatever it is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I don't even know anything about this All next right. thing. Okay. Like nothing. Never even heard you it. Oh, well, I'm going to. Uh, Tell me about wait, it. Wait, yes, we just talked about it at the beginning. The Scottish play? Yeah. Macbeth. Oh, well, oh, is that? Oh, got it. Got it. You didn't read. I'm going to inform you. Thank you. <laughs> it's okay. So at the beginning, we were talking about superstitions. And there's superstitions in theater. I think... They're going to be superstitions in anything you do, but I think it depends on the person. Yeah. Right. Like a lot of people have little rituals or things they do before the show or whatever it's going to be. Like I said, if you say good luck, someone can be like, well, you're supposed to break a leg. I'm, I'm not really yeah. all of that. But one of the big ones in theater is the Scottish play, which is that that's what they say. Right. The Scottish play instead of saying Macbeth. So Got it. it says you should never say Macbeth inside of a theater. You call it the Scottish play. Shakespeare was a British playwright, we all know that. The euphemism refers to the Scottish setting. The superstition also extends to calling the title character the Scottish king or Scottish lord and his wife the Scottish lady instead of Lady Macbeth, right? A wildly popular play, the Scottish play, aka Macbeth, was often put on in theaters with financial troubles to attempt to reserve their fate. Thus began the association of the work with failing theaters. So they're sort of saying, like, like, now the, the superstition is if you say that name inside the theater, it's gonna, like put a curse on the show. Things are going to go wrong. Bad things are going to happen, whatever it may be. Now, it's funny because on this little explanation, it says very specifically inside the theater. Yeah. I think it's grown to where students in particular are like, you can't even say it. What? Like, no. What? Yes, Goodbye. You, you can. It's good. like they get, they get crazy. No. But it's all, they're also kids. They're yeah. being silly. But. I didn't realize that was where the history of it came from though, because mm-hmm. Macbeth was put on in theaters that were having a hard time. There you go. I didn't know that yeah. either. All right. The next thing is the house and it can refer to a couple of things in theater. 
the actual auditorium where the audience is, as well as the front of house, which includes the lobby, box office, and front of house personnel, like the house manager, box office attendants, and ushers. And if you're having a problem inside the theater, you'll want to speak to the house manager. You may have also heard the phrase house seats, which are seats reserved by producers or the heads of house, typically in the orchestra and considered the best in the theater. House seats open, or house seats, excuse me, don't go on sale to the public unless they are unsold as the performance date approaches. So I think most yes. people know house. It's so funny because some, you know, it's funny. I think yes. And then I think because we teach students, I'm always so surprised when they don't know terms mm. where I'm like, what? How do you not know that? But they, then they learn it, right? right. It takes one time for somebody to right. say something. Um, and I think it's great because we have a program at our school that we have leadership students who learn these positions, house manager, ushering mm -hmm. front. Like, so when I have to explain to them that too, like, this is the front of house, this is what's considered the house. This is where, so they, they sort of understand that. Um, House seats is a good one too. And I, I've known that term for a long time, but I think a lot of people probably wouldn't know mm -hmm. how that means. Um, I, I wonder, does it give where the term came from? So that's interesting. Like, yeah. where did house come from? Right. Mm -hmm. Why don't they just call it auditorium audience theater? Or, yeah. Seat the audience. Yeah. 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 Or the foyer. Right. Right. I, you never call it that. The lobby. You could maybe Let's call it the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the yeah. lobby. Okay. All right. We can skip the next one because I already did this you one. You did. Previous Upstage and Downstage. Podcast. Quick review, everybody. Upstage is upstage because it used to be on a rake stage where the back was higher and the front of the stage was a little lower downstage. And I don't know if we talked about the following one either, but you can talk about it now just in case. I mean... I think we've talked about it, but I wonder, oh yeah. So no, at the bottom explains a little bit of why it's called that. So the next term, theater term is blocking, which for those of you who are listening to our theater, people are like, thanks guys. We know these terms, but I some like, of them, you don't know. <laughs> everybody. Like, right. And the limelight one, but I think learning, I don't even know the origin of blocking. I mean, I know yeah. what blocking is right? right. But like the origin of it is interesting. So to start off at elementary, Blocking is the staging of the actors. So like path they take, the movement, where they're going to go. Um, and honestly, I just had a conversation about this with my cast because we open our show tonight. And I really explained to them the importance of it. I think students and, and maybe even some new actors often think like it's a suggestion, right? Like, oh, yeah. how nice that this director has given me like this blocking. I'm like, guys. Literally, the lights have been set based off of your blocking. Cues have been set based off of things you're doing and movement you're doing. And hey, P.S., the other 30 kids in this show are expecting you to do the blocking we gave you. Right. It is essentially choreography in a scene. So yeah. don't go changing it because you feel like moving the other way today. And there, some of them are looking at me like, oh, okay, okay. Like they, they, they literally did not know like they're starting to get really comfortable and so now they're just like going rogue and right. i'm like y'all you cannot do that the blocking especially once it's set has to remain the way it is um okay the term came into popular use in the 60s based on the tradition of 19th century theater directors who worked out their scenes on a mini model of the stage using blocks to represent actors i think that is cool me too that is awesome I think because oftentimes I will also say staging, like we're going to stage this right now, some stage this right now. I, I will interchange those terms. Yeah. But that makes sense of where blocking came from. Because if they were doing it on a mini model and they had little blocks. Yeah. I love that. That's very cool. That's awesome. So uh, along those lines. I don't know the next one. I don't either. Oh, sorry. But along those lines. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Karen Culliver, Broadway's Karen Culliver who has, who I've done a few shows with, she will sit and block a scene when she's thinking about it with pennies. She'll like move pennies around like a piece of paper to be what, like how she wants, she's, as she thinks about it and processes That is it. so not how my brain works. Yeah. What? 
Yeah, that whole like blocking with little blocks, I would be, I would, they'd be in the trash. I'd be like, get, get out of my area. I need real people. Because honestly, and this is, everyone is different. And I think as I've mentored people, it, everyone works differently. Mm -hmm. I rarely lock in a formation for choreography until I'm in the room. So I will kind of, this kind of, I kind of want it to be this bowling pin. Yeah. I kind of want to, I kind of want to have lines. And I sort of know, and I mark that in my choreography book, but I know some choreographers and many who will literally place every single cast member in the formation before they even go into the room. Not how my brain works. Same with blocking. Like I have an idea. I'll look at the scene and I'll kind of be like, Ooh, yeah, this, I want this, I want this, I want that. I am. I so work more in the moment yeah. with the actors because it's something that I always liked as an actor and a performer where my director has a vision and an idea, but really wants it to also feel right for the performer. Right. And so oftentimes I'll sort of like skeleton outline the scene. And then I'm like, oh, guys play with it because you're the actor, mm -hmm. right? I'm here to guide you. If it's set in stone, sometimes it just gets stale and doesn't feel Well, right. And it doesn't genuine. feel natural necessarily because it's like if yeah. someone's left-handed and you're asking them to always indicate with their right hand, that might feel less natural than them moving and indicating with their left hand for something or whatever, you know? We we told that story, I think, when Maggie was on here, right? About her being left-handed. We told uh, that yeah. story. When I did Charlie Brown with her ah, there you go. and I was doing all the choreography and all these movements and she kept using the other hand. And I, at first was like, girl, like use this hand. And then I'm like, wait, are you left-handed? She was like, yeah, <laughs> you're absolutely right. And so oh. then I'm like, well, maybe we should give you some more left-handed gestures right. to get more. But see, that's exactly natural. It. Exactly. It. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You want to read the next Yeah, I will. I've never heard this. Term. I haven't either. We're both learning something new today. Vom, named for the Latin vomitorium, a vom is a specific type of entranceway in theater. They signify an entrance or an exit for the actors that emerge beneath seating, which I'm like, what? Um, That's cool. It is. But in ancient Rome, vomitoriums were corridors built beneath or behind seats of a Colosseum, stadium, theater, or arena. The wide entryways were made to spew out or vomit people. <laughs> That's so funny. That is funny. The Coliseum is designed so that 50,000 seats can be emptied in 15 minutes. That is so cool. Yep. Broadway Circle and the Square Theater, as well as the Vivian mm -hmm. Beaumont at Lincoln Center Theater, both use VOMs, which tend to be more common in thrust stages and in the round stages like these. So literally before you finish reading this, I thought of the few shows I've seen in the round. Uh-huh. 300%. I know what they're talking about. So my sister did a few shows in the round that I saw gypsy singing in the rain and they have those entrances that go out underneath the audience. Yeah. So like the stage is in the center, right? And you think like almost like a circus, right? And yeah. then the, the, all of the entrances are underneath. I just never knew they were called voms. Yeah. I learned something. There you go. You should text your sister and see if she knew they were called voms. I bet you she did. Probably. She knows everything, but I'll ask her. I will ask her. I'm going to test her. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, the next one, go. All right. I I like this one. I'm going <laughs> to tell a funny story. How, Christopher, have you ever seen the movie Waiting for Guffman? I have not. Okay. So it you, you should see it. It's like um, A Mighty Wind was the first. Mm -hmm. Christopher Guest. Do you know who Christopher Guest is? I do. So a mighty he's a comedic writer, actor. So like A Mighty Wind. Uh, Waiting for Guffman, Best in Show. Like yep. They did all of those funny comedies. Um, and there is a scene with Catherine O'Hara in Waiting for Guffman that used to be one of my favorite. And it's like these old, like small town people trying to put on a show and they're auditioning, right? And they come out and they have like a stool. I think it's a stool. And they're like, oh, sh should, we, should we strike it? Should we strike it? Like, like they're trying to say they like know the terminology and they're like, yeah, just take it. Okay, I'm going to strike this. I'm going to strike this. It's so funny. That movie is so funny. Oh, if you've man. never seen it, Go watch it. I could, there's so many quotes from that movie that to this day, um, I just say, because yeah. it's hilarious. Um, so the term is strike and striking, um, striking the set or taking down the set. That's the end of the show, right? So striking 
a show means at the end of the production, mm -hmm. you're taking up scenery, you're striking all the audio equipment, you're putting the costumes away, you're taking all the props away. Um, you can also use strike in the middle of a performance when you're going to take something off the stage in between a scene or, hey, in the scene change, we're striking the bed, we're setting, right? Mm -hmm. That's the other term, like the opposite term. So we're going to set the, the chairs over here and we're going to spike them. That's another one that students get confused. Strike and spike, two mm -hmm. different things. Yes, very. So spiking something is marking it with tape on the stage so you know where to place it. That's spiking. Striking is when you're going to remove it from the stage and it's going to go away. So um, where it came from, let's see, striking. On a smaller scale, you can strike an object from the stage, strike that ladder, strike it, obviously waiting for government to strike this. Um, this is actually one of the dozen dictionary definitions for the word strike, meaning to haul down, to dismantle and take away. So I guess that term just brought itself to be instead yeah. of removing, right? We're going to strike this. That's yeah. just the theater term. Um, it oh, good. I'm glad you get the next one. It's very I fitting know. for you. Agreed. I also wanted to say about spiking. Let's, if you are going to spike something, say on a black stage, maybe don't use like a charcoal gray spike. <laughs> I dislike Christopher knows when me well. people don't think and they're like, let me put this thing on the stage that tells somebody quickly and instantly where to put something else. And maybe yeah. the goal should be to have it as highly visible as possible to the person moving said set piece. And when you have maybe a bright color, say maybe a bright color, a black stage and you put like a dark charcoal gray spike on the stage, that's not really going to contrast well. So I'm thinking like, <laughs> it's not working out well for us. Like maybe like a, a, a hot pink or, or a bright yellow. yellow. So mm -hmm. I'm just mm -hmm. like, come on people. Okay. Bright colors. The next this. one on this list, I just did just last night with my most recent oh, production it's of like dog one of my fight things um i technically did a, a combined thing of a band rehearsal slash sits probe everybody sits probe and this is another term of german origins in case you couldn't figure that out because if you look at it it looks very german and it translates to seated rehearsal and this is typically the first rehearsal when the band or orchestra and the cast sing through the show in its entirety while sitting at music stands. Now, this other one, Jared Gertner, Broadway's Jared Gertner, loves this other version. He's like, sits probe, eh, that's okay. But I prefer, prefer? I prefer a <laughs> vondel probe, which is similar, but it's basically joining the instrumentalists and onstage performers. But as the actors wander through their blocking on the stage, vondel probe. I like that. Yeah. Did you not know about Vondel Probes? I think it depends probes? on the show. No, I never heard of it. I, I think I, I think it depends on the show. Okay. So we did a sits probe for Into the Woods, and I actually preferred them just sitting and singing because there's so much music yep. in that show. I felt like it was really, really important to have the focus be on the musicians and the vocals and not necessarily movement. Yep. But other shows where you can sort of like mark through your, Ooh, that's another. I term. was like, what does marking um, mean, Charna? Okay. <laughs> so marking, if you know, is where you are not doing your choreography or whatever it may be. It could be vocals, it could yeah. be your blocking. You, you're not doing it full out. You're not doing it all the way performance level. You're holding back a bit and just marking the choreography you're in your spot, but you're not doing six turns, right? Yeah. You're, you're not going full out. Um, but that's interesting. Vondel probe. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah. I could use that. Yeah. Fun. All right. You do the next one. It is more in All my right, realm, overture. but you do it. It is. I love me an overture. I Same. love a good overture. And I actually think as we start to get some of these newer shows, they're, they're sort of lost. Yes. Overtures that were so beautiful. Like Gypsy's Overture is one of my favorite top, overtures top. Ever, ever. I think ever. it's the best I one. I love it. I always say. And I will say, I think, and I'm going to say in olden days, I sound like I'm <laughs> 75 years old. Um, <laughs> in the olden days, um, I think when musicals 
were only performed with live musicians, overtures were much more a thing. Yeah. And to be honest with you, I do not want to hear a four minute overture on a recording. No. Like, I'm just, just like, doesn't... cool, we could cut that to 40 seconds. I 100% so, just anyway, did an that. Overture, before we get into the discussion, yeah. is um, a medley of tunes. I love that. A medley of tunes from the score of a musical. So essentially, usually an overture, which is played at the very, very top of the show, the beginning of the show, is only songs from act one because they don't want to give away too much. Sometimes they'll do something from act two, but usually it's mostly songs from act one and depends on the show. Um, but it's sort of a way to, you know, the audience realizes, Oh, we're starting. And again, years ago, the conductor would come out. Yeah. Like they still do this. Um, in certain shows I've seen the conductor will come out. The conductor will like take a little bow, say like hi to the audience, mm -hmm. but like acknowledge the audience and turn around and at the start of the show. And they can be anywhere from, two to three to four minutes, depending on the show. And they'll play a bunch of the song. And I, I love it when it's live musicians because yeah. you're listening to the musicians play. And then it sort of sets the, sets the tone for what we're, we're going to get into. And then they don't have this one here, but mm -hmm. the same thing for the top of act two is called an entract. And that is where you sort of like mimic an overture, often shorter, almost always shorter yeah. than an overture. Um, and it's usually songs from act two, sort of like a preview to get the audience sort of locked back into what we're doing in the show. Um, it says the term comes from the French overture, overture. How would you say that? I think it's just literally. I don't speak French. I don't either. But overture? Really? Yeah, I think so. Cause oh, you in French I, just, yeah, it could be wa, but I think it all, maybe it is. I don't know. Cause Wauverture. I don't speak French, but. Well, it's been Love a long a time since I took uh, my French which means diction opening. class. So. so that I didn't know that. I didn't know that overture meant opening. Yeah. I like that. And it, it is. It's the opening of the show. And some overtures are shorter. Um, some lead right into whatever we're yes. doing, like uh, Chicago. Yep. Um, that's uh, one of my other favorite overtures. Same. But some overtures, it's like, da -da 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 -da, and then there's like thunderous applause, and Whoa. then we open up to the stage. Yeah. Yeah. I think that the overture is a lost art. And I think that the, I don't, I don't know. Like, again, I'm doing dogfight right now and there's no overture. It doesn't even start with the band. It starts with the main character playing guitar on stage. And mm. um, it's kind of, it's cool. Uh, I think it sets the tone that they want to set, but there's something for me about, especially if you don't know a show, having those little mm -hmm. snippets and previews of what's going to be when they happen in the show, it's automatically going to feel familiar. And I yes, think that helps it that. stick with you a little bit. Like it'll help things. Translate. I also think it, it really brings people into the moment. Like I'm all about starting a show in a different way or something different, or like if in the writing, but I think it sort of just sets, like it gives the audience two minutes to be like, we're in show mode and sort of like buy into what the vibe of the show is going to be. Right. Right. Absolutely. I, I love me a good overture. Oh, me too. And an on track. But which so again, many people I will don't stand know. by. Track is like, I'll, I'll cut some of it if it's tracked, but like live musicians oh, I love. I 100% cut the on track in Bright Star because we use tracks. Because I'm like, why? Yeah. Why? Yeah. It's not. You don't necessary. need it. I know. It's sort of a lost art. Well, we should just always use live musicians. That's all I'm saying. Um, I mean, I, I would be down. I just oh, need I know. a million dollars. Right. So if anybody's listening and wants to donate, make some grants for all the projects that Sharna and I work on yeah. to have live musicians, here we are. And I will, not just for me personally, but, and I would love to hear from some of my students or kids who have done shows with us with tracks and then with live music it is a completely different experience absolutely and i think it's so important for them and look i'm not a hater of tracks i think it's awesome that we have the ability to do both but i think i don't i don't want there to be this like mass exodus of live musicians. Like, I don't think we can replace that yeah. with tracks, the op the option to do it at certain levels of theater, but like kids learning 
to perform with live musicians, it's a completely different skill, completely different yeah. skill. And what I love is the interaction. I'm telling you, Sits Probe used to be my favorite day of rehearsal yeah. because you've been practicing and you've been practicing maybe just with piano, maybe with tracks to start, whatever. And then you get in there and you're like, oh my gosh, this is like a relationship. Like this band is going to feel my emotion in this song. And I'm going to, when the horns come in and then it like supports my exciting moment, right? Yeah. I, I love it. It's so it's very important for kids to have that experience. It's also my favorite day of the rehearsal process because if I've been plunking on, don't get me wrong, I love me playing some piano. But when yeah. I bring in the full band or the full orchestra, it's like so gratifying and so exciting. And it really, <coughs> excuse me, allows for more specificity. Yeah. Oh, like 100%. I, when there's underscoring, underscoring is one of my favorite things in theater. Listen up, Ryan it Miller. adds so much emotion. But what'd you say? I said, listen up, Ryan Miller. He's not a huge fan of the underscore. Oh, just... And I was like, absolutely incorrect. I'm sorry. I just learned something around Ryan Miller that like hurts my heart. <laughs> I'm going to go into work today and be like, knock, knock. I heard that you don't like underscoring. We can't be friends. Um, I, it adds... <laughs> It adds such emotion. Yeah. It's like watching film with no film score. Yeah. So, but, but when it's tracked underscoring, I also want to poke my eyes out because it doesn't fit. And oftentimes yes. the actor will speak too quickly or too slowly and then it, it jumbles things. Yep. But like, and I, you know, when you are, you know, I'm preaching to the choir, yeah. but for our listeners, the ability to like, okay, we're going to, we're going to repeat this measure. We're going to hold right until we're, and then we can look at the actor. So if that night it just landed a little differently, it just gives her a lot of creativity yeah. and spontaneity in a good way. Yes. And yeah. there's just Ryan such Miller. a, I hope he listens to our podcast. <laughs> I give him a big thumbs down on that. <laughs> That's so oh, funny. Oh, gosh. He doesn't listen to this. He doesn't have time. <laughs> he doesn't have time. Ryan Miller, we're calling you out. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, that's our last one. So, Sharna, I want you to tell me the name of our podcast. The full name. Oh, Uncommon Sense, the 11 o'clock number. The 11 o'clock number. And I've had so many people be like, why is that part of the name of your podcast? I'm like, do you not know what an 11 o'clock number is? Well, finally, here I you really go. I really like that this is our last term. Right? It was so serendipitous. Yeah. Serendipity. All right, here we go. So back in the day, shows typically began at 8.30 p.m., which means when 11 o'clock rolled around, it was time for the big show-stopping number, the penultimate song in the show. And there are three general types of 11 o'clock numbers. And one is the soul bearer. The group toe tapper <laughs> and the solo toe tapper. I think, Sharna, if we had to pick a number that described our podcast, it would be the group toe tapper. The group toe tapper. <laughs> if it falls in a category. That just came out of nowhere. I think if we had to choose, it would be the group toe tapper. Yeah. I agree with that. Because yeah, it's like it's like a huge group dance number yeah. where everyone is jumping around and it's a big shabang yeah. 11 o'clock number so the or the soul bearing solo right. right the soul bearer like rose's turn from gypsy gypsy's getting a lot of shout outs today dream roll dream roll <laughs> or lola's hold me in your heart from kinky boots marks a massive emotional yeah. shift or a coming to you for the main character now the group toe tapper is a trademark of older musicals like sit down you're rocking the boat from Guys and Dolls, yeah. or again, yeah. another one we've referenced today, The Brotherhood of Man from How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying. And was the composer- I love that number, I, I love that show. It's good. And was the composer's chance to give people a buoyant tune to hum on their way out of the theater. Last but not least, mm -hmm. the solo toe tapper isn't even rarer nowadays, but includes songs like Hello Dolly's So Long, Dearie, yeah. Good sh good show too. Man, but, I haven't done that show in a long time. Yeah. I'd love to do that show again. We are definitely it's the group one. toe tapper cuz we're just a lot yeah. of fun. Yeah. Oh, for sure. It's funny um out of this paragraph, the fact that shows began at 8:30. Yeah. 
is so crazy to me. You almost feel like, or I'm not putting words in your mouth or thoughts in your head. I almost feel like we would have gone the other way. <laughs> like, like with how our world has just so constant, always doing, doing and staying up late. Like, it seems like in the olden days, we should have had like a little checkbox of how many times <laughs> I've said that today. That shows would have started Counter. earlier. Like now it seems backward to me. It seems really interesting that we've mm. moved up um, curtain. Now curtain, it's funny because when you go to New York, most shows are eight. Yes. Like that's, they're, they're still in that eight. And it's so funny when people come to Orange County um, because even at our big performance spaces around here, curtains at 7.30, sometimes even seven or 6.30, depending on the day, which is crazy. Right. Um, and then at school, we're usually a seven o'clock curtain. And so there's all these different like times going around, but so it doesn't make it an 11 o'clock number. It's not like a nine o'clock number when, yeah. we, when, when we do it around here, <laughs> but it's true. It's this moment in the show where it's like a big moving piece, a big number. Yeah. Um, and I think it's very crucial to sort of the musical structure. Yeah. You know? It I wraps it up in a nice bow one way or another. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. All right. Sharno fans. Number. Well, we hope you enjoyed, uh, joining us on our journey. Join us. Ooh. Leave your fields of flower. All Name right. Pippin. I was like, what is happening okay. in my brain? <laughs> I was like, Meh. I was like, did I just have a little stroke? Possibly. So anyway, uh, thank you for joining us on our journey of theatrical terminology. We hope you learned something or just had some fun listening to us discuss theater terms. And on that note, Sharnifer, Sharnifer out. Strike. Strike. <laughs> We're striking. We're and striking curtain. curtain on common and sense, scene. the 11 o'clock number. <laughs> now y'all know what that means. So nobody asked me again. And scene. <laughs> oh my gosh. <sighs> Cut. Cut. That's, that's more a film term. Film. Hold. We're in a hold. We're in a hold, hold is a big one. Oh, love a my hold. My students learned that one on day zero where I'm like, everybody hold. <laughs> hold. And my favorite is when I I'm like the kids who don't hold yeah. and they just keep going yeah. and you're like, Hold pertains to you. Hold pertains to you. Well, I know we're done, but now I have another story. So, like, the, I'm always the person who's never in earshot unless you're on a God mic, which, by the way, God mic mm -hmm. is the microphone that goes through all of the things in the theater and the monitors and everything so that everybody can hear when the director or something is calling. A hold, for example. But if there's not a God mic, Yahoo behind the piano can't hear anything. And the director is yelled, hold. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the entire cast is screaming at me, stop, hold. I'm like, oh. okay, all right, okay. Everyone calm down. Anyway. I couldn't hear. I couldn't hear. Anyway. Okay, oh, friends. Man. So like and subscribe on YouTube. Follow us on Instagram, at Sharnifer Official. Check out UncommonPod.com if you want to learn more about us or just get some merch. Sharnifer, out. Out. <laughs> Strike. Scene. Ooh. Blackout. Blackout. This concludes another episode of Uncommon Sense. If you're ready for more of this fresh, hilarious, and unique perspective on the world of entertainment, education, and life, be sure to subscribe right now to catch every episode. If you gasped, laughed out loud, or even snorted, share the show with your friends and aspiring entertainers, because, let's be real, sharing is caring. For more Sharnifer, tune in to their witty insights by checking out the website uncommonpod.com or connecting on social media. Tune in next week and get the real insider scoop on another episode of Uncommon Sense.